Yes, Mr. Dinelli. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, I might invite my learned friend, Mr. Sherry, to call um, Mr. Van Horen back to the witness box. Yes. Van Horen, you're still uh, responding to the summons originally issued and uh, the oath that was administer uh, originally administered still persists. Do sit down. Mr Van Horen, have you made a statement dated today in relation to this matter? Yes, I have. Do you have it with you there, sir? Sure. Is, is it, um, does it have the ID number CBA 9007 Zero 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 one zero 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 one. Yes, it does. And does this replace an earlier statement you'd made about the same topic? Yes, it does. Now, the only changes to paragraph 59G and 59 capital A? Yes. Are the contents of that statement true and correct, sir? They are. Tender that statement, Your Honour. That will be <coughs> exhibit. 1.161, uh, statement of Mr Van Horen, uh, CBA 9007-001-001. Now, you said it was a document of today's date, is that right? Yes, Your Honour, it replaced an earlier version where we made these this two This got amendments. into the system? Oh, I'm sorry. That's the document, Your Honour. It, it was given a new number, Your Honour. All right. Could we just scroll down to 59, paragraph 59A, just to be absolutely sure? 59 capital A, please. Next page, please. 59 capital A is new, Your Honour. And there's been um, two sentences, <coughs> excuse me, added to the end of 59G. Yeah. And they refer to two new documents that we yeah. refer... Um, All I'll say, Mr Sherry, is that yes, mistakes happen. Yes, mistakes have got to be corrected. But it is much better if it is done much sooner than on the day. Yes, Your Honour. Uh, it's... It, it presents real difficulties for everyone. Yes, sir. And it's a, it's a problem to which I will have to return, I'm afraid, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the evidence that will be called uh, uh, next after uh, this witness. Uh, late, I, I know things go wrong. I know things have to be amended. Not the night before. Do go on. Thank you, sir. Hello again, Mr Van Horen. Good day. You told us earlier this week, in fact, you may have now told the Commission on two previous occasions <coughs> that you're the Executive General Manager of Retail Products within the Retail Banking Services Business Unit of CBA. That's right. Um, and relevantly, for the purpose of today, you are responsible for o overseeing most aspects of the retail products offered by CBA, including credit cards? Yes. Now, am I right to say that CBA issues credit cards under two separate brands? Uh, yes, the group issues uh, cards under the CBA brand, obviously, Commonwealth Bank, but also at Bankwest. Bankwest is not part of my area of responsibility. I see. So therefore, your statement and what we're going to talk about today deals with CBA branded That's credit right. cards. Now, you'll recall me doing a similar thing on the last occasion we were together. But throughout the evidence you'll be giving today, I'm going to refer to a particular period as the relevant period. And I would like to refer to that period, November 2014 to November 2015. Sure. And during that period, um, CBA offered credit cards to new and existing customers. Yes, we did. Um, and I, um, as um, I assume your organisation still does, you do that um, in a variety of ways, um, the two of which, or sorry, the three of which you identify at paragraph 7A is 
between conversations between CBA staff and customers in branch or over the telephone? That's right. Um, or in, I guess, conversations with relationship managers? Yeah, typically private bankers or premier bankers, yes. I see. Uh, messages delivered using NetBank or the ComBank um, app? Yeah. Um, and mail or email correspondence? Yes. Um, the, just for, um, just so I can maybe use your language from the bank, the assisted channels, that's where you have a discussion with a person, either in person or over the phone. Is Correct, that, yeah. That's the, what you call the assisted channels. Correct. And the, um, uh, the digital channels are via messages delivered on, on the website or the ComBank app? Yeah, either NetBank, which is the cust an existing customer secure portal, or ComBank, available to anybody, or the app, which is on your mobile phone. Uh, or, and perhaps um, the more traditional way, by mail? Yeah. Um, and even by um, direct email? Yes. Uh, and you saw, you, you were in, the hearing room moments ago when so Mr was, Harris yep. gave evidence. Yep. Um, so at various points in his inter, uh, um, conversations or interactions with the bank, um, he had discussions over the phone about these credit, about a credit limit increase via um, messages and mail. We saw examples of that. Yeah, various interactions. I think the applications, as I understand it, the initial three were digital, online. Yes and the credit limit increases were in relation to, he, he responded to CLIs. There were other interactions as well around um, statement questions and various others that Mr. Harris referred to no. and, and other interactions as of course. well. Of course, of course. And we'll return to Mr. Harris and um, he will be um, a case study that I'd like to explore sure. with you um, and, um, and, and I'll come to that in due course. Now, Am I right to say that during the relevant period, uh, CBA would receive credit card applications through these assisted channels and also from the digital channels by people completing an online application form? Correct. And the form that you, that CBA used in relation to these credit applications varied depending upon um, the customer's eligibility? Yes, and the customer's um, sta status or history with the group. So uh, if, if, for example, it was a, a customer who was brand new to the Commonwealth Bank, we typically took them through what we call a long form. In other words, um, asking them significant amounts of information about employment, dependents, income expenses, assets, liabilities, and so on. Uh, on the other hand, if it was an existing customer who'd been with us for more than six months, um, uh, we had credit history with them, then we'd use a short form, which is an, a, a shortened version of that application process. I, I think you described the people for whom you'd give a short form or a medium form. I'll deal largely with short form. I'll ask you a, mo yeah. question, a, a, moment in, a question in a moment about the medium form. But the short form, if someone, I think you've already given this evidence, if someone is a customer for at least six months, low risk of missing future repayments, had a credit card product in the last six months, less than 70,000 of unsecured commercial lending exposure, hasn't been flagged as a recipient of Centrelink benefits, and their salary was in, in a CBA account, deposited into a CBA account, you'd be entitled, entitled might not be the right word, but you'd be eligible to use the short form application. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Yeah, so two points. One is this is about eligibility to go through a short yes. form process and just one slight uh, modification to what you said, and it is in paragraph 13 of my statement, um, to, to be eligible for short form, they, they had not been declined for another credit card in the previous six months, I think you said, have received. It was, on the contrary, if you had oh, been I'm declined sorry, I'm sorry. for a credit card of in course, six Ms. months, Van then you wouldn't go short form. So they'd not been declined. So if, if they'd been declined the month prior for another credit card, you, you would have to go long form. Okay, I understand. And is the distinction, put at a high level, is the distinction between a short form, medium form and long form, the amount of information you obtain about the customer? Um, it's, 
it certainly is, it, it will change the amount of information we ask for from cu ask customers to supply us with. The reason we can do that is because for existing customers, we already have a lot of that information and therefore we don't ask them to re-provide the information. We generally would present some of that back to them to confirm that it is accurate. I see. Uh, and is that what you refer to in paragraph 13F where you say their salary income was deposited into a CBA account? Is that because you're able to pre-populate essentially their income? I wouldn't say pre-populate as much as um, we, we historically per, uh, performed an eligibility assessment. In other words, we would look at the customer's profile and for customers who had their salary deposited into a CBA account, we therefore had a fair amount of information about what it was. And that would then be used to screen the entire three million customer base for, on the credit card side to see who was eligible uh, to go down a short form path. If they were ineligible for other reasons, then they would knock out of that and they would go for a long form or a medium form. I'm, um, I'm with you so far. And if it was a short form, what you required was the number of dependents, one, two, the person's expenses, and three, the person's liabilities held with other financial institutions. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and I think we called them OFI liabilities on the last occasion we were together. Other financial institution liabilities, okay. OFI, yeah. And CBA would automatically derive the customer's income, as I understood, and you can correct me, but the, for the purposes of the short form, CBA was to, to automatically derive the customer's income based on the value of deposits and therefore put into that form what their income was. Yeah, so I think it's, it's important to think of this. There are two stages. The first stage is determining who may be eligible. So there's an eligibility yes. thing that we do in the background. The second stage is when a customer initiates an application, then they will go down one of those paths. So once they have initiated a short form application, then you correct. We would say, well, based on the information we have from what we see look like salary credits, we think your income is X. Um, please confirm or change it if it's not X. And if it's not X, then they would need to tell us what it is. I see. Uh, because some of the eligibility things, I think you'd concede some of them are not very um, discerning. One of them, for example, is just if you've been a customer for six months, you sort of automatically tick one box. Yeah, correct. Uh, and as I say in the in the evidence, it's uh, set out six criteria here. It's and, it's not all. It's I understand. all of the above, not correct. just not just. Yeah. And one of which is that you've got less than seventy thousand of unsecured consumer yes. lending. I mean, again, that's yeah. it, if it's I may a, say, it's not that discerning. Bar. I agree with that. Yeah. Apologies, sir. Now, so for the short form, one would have before, that is the Commonwealth would have before it um, the information that's been put in and the customer's income, sort of pre-populated subject to the change, um, any change that would be made. Um, and then after, uh, and it also requires in CBA to confirm that they're not, that the customer's not aware of any further changes or future changes to their circumstances, is that right? That's right. Now, in terms of the way in which CBA verified that information in respect of the short form application, as I understand it, CBA would go to an external credit bureau check, is that right? Yes. Um, so the verification path varied slightly depending on whether it was short form or long form. Um, but in either case, we would do an external bureau check. And um, if it was a long form, do you only want to know about short form or you want short form and long form? No, let's just deal with short form first. Short form. Um, so we would verify that customer's income based on our internal records, which we think is possibly the most reliable of ways to verify income because if we know the salary has been credited and we can identify it as a salary credit, then we've got high confidence that's correct. So that would be the way we'd verify the income. Would be be by looking at the credits in their own account. I see. Um, and you say that CBA, in your evidence, verified living expenses by, um, or perhaps I'll take you to what um, 
um, the way in which you put it under the heading reasonable steps to verify the customer's financial circumstances in paragraph 25E. And you say that the customer's declared living expenses were compared against an internal benchmark, the higher of which was used in CBA's assessment of serviceability. Now we've discussed that before, you'll recall. Uh, that involves, does it not, um, the, um, the use of either the living expenses that they provided or the internal benchmark, a HEM-like? Yeah, it was derived from HEM initially, and as I've said in previous testimony, we've changed to uh, the income-based HEM, but in either case, we always took the higher of whatever the customer declared themselves and what the benchmark suggested the, the expenses should um, be. And again, I've, I've asked you this, but I want to clarify it the same in relation to credit cards, but CBA doesn't take, didn't take any step to verify the customer's living expenses that were provided? No, we, we would consider that we asked the customer what the expenses were and uh, you know, the notion of reasonable inquiries, and it, a lot of this comes back to what is reasonable um, for credit applications like this. We uh, tested that declared living expense against the benchmark living expense. I see. Um, and for some customers who had a low income or were considered higher risk, um, there would be an additional check and you'd verify CBA, any CBA liabilities against CBA's records or any or documents, OFI liabilities which against documents provided, is that Correct. right? So this applied where customers ha had an income below a certain level or um, a credit score below a, score, a certain score on our internal credit scoring models. And so if it was triggering those, then we would do the verification by looking at bank statements or the like. I see. Uh, and you'd do that on the basis if they had a low, um, a low income? Yeah, from memory it was an income below $37,000 a year. Um, and the internal score probably wouldn't mean much because it's a, it's a credit model on a rating scale. But presumably in relation to that person on uh, uh, earning that much money, the credit limit that they would be uh, interested, that they would be applying for would have some relationship to $37,000 would be the yeah, case? Yeah, this goes to the responsible lending question, but yes, and that's the next step in the responsible lending process is to test for serviceability and suitability. Um, so in short, as I understand what happened, at the relevant time, and it may have changed, but let's just deal with the relevant time. You'd confirm their income, they would declare their expenses, declare their liabilities, declare the number of independents, and pass an external credit check. That would be the, is that a fair summary of the situation? Correct. Now, I've put to you previously that the Uh, the requirements of the National Credit Act, I can take you back to it if you like, but um, you'd recall from our discussion the other day and also from your knowledge um, of the National Credit Act that the CBA is of course prohibited from entering into a credit contract with a customer without making reasonable inquiries. That's right. About their financial situation and also taking reasonable steps to verify um, the customer's financial situation. I can't recall if I did take you to it, and forgive me if I did, but it might be worth returning to rcd.0021.0001, .0088. I rather think we have been here before with yeah, Mr. Van I'm Horen. I'm reasonably not. familiar with that. Thank so, you. Yep. Thank so, you. Yep. Um, and, uh, it might have been senior <coughs> counsel assisting, or in fact it could have been me that went to this. Can I just remind you of a couple of parts of this regulatory sure. guide? So this is regulatory guide 209. <coughs> um, point 0103. Um, and if that could be expanded. Um, you'll recall there that reasonable inquiries about a custom, sorry, a consumer's financial situation will generally include 
um, the cu consumer's current amount and source of income or benefits? Yeah. And B, the extent of consumer's fixed expenses? Yes. And of course, the extent of the, um, sorry, the consumer's variable living expenses um, and variable um, expenses such as dependence and any other particular unusual circumstances. You see that? Yes. And you've given evidence of the extent to which you consider the declared expenses is only if they exceed the relevant hem that you use. You don't otherwise verify those expenses. Uh, no, we, we would take the higher of those Correct. two amounts. Um, in a short form, we would not verify those expense numbers. If the customer says it's higher than the benchmark, then we would use that number. Uh, and then, um, if I could take you to um, the next um, paragraph. Depending on the circumstance of the particular consumer and the kind of credit contract or consumer lease they may require, reasonable inquiries could also include um, other ex the consumer's other expenditure that may be discretionary, such as entertainment, takeaway food, alcohol, tobacco and gambling. Do you see yes, that? Yes, yep. Um, so, depending on the circumstances, reasonable inquiries could also include considering those matters. Yep, that's right. And you would concede at least after Commonwealth Bank found out about um, Mr Harris's gambling, that is after that conversation, uh, it didn't uh, make any reasonable inquiries before giving him a um, credit limit increase, did it? Uh, so just to be clear, we're talking about the last credit limit yes, increase I'm from 2017 to 35. Just yeah, I think, uh, you know, as I've uh, said out in my witness statement, we've acknowledged that we should not have provided that final credit lim limit offer. Um, and the basis for saying that is having had the conversation with one of our staff members in a contact centre and declaring that uh, Mr Harris had a gambling problem, to use the simple um, description of it without in any way trying to minimise the, the challenge that presented, um, that information was not in any way um, passed through to credit decisioning systems and you know that's a failing and we acknowledge that and we've got to find ways to address that. Um, so uh, to that extent having declared it to somebody working in the Commonwealth Bank we did not use that information for the subsequent credit, credit offer. See and we'll come to this but of course the, uh, the subsequent credit offer being at the highest level of what a credit limit increase could be, $8,000. Yes, we cap any, any one CLI, if I can use the phrase credit limit increase, CLI, any one CLI in, in our decisioning is capped at a maximum of $8,000, uh, regardless of any other circumstances. I see. If I could take you to point 0107. Just before we part from um, RG20933, <coughs> take the case of a customer who um, does not uh, identify that he or she uh, has a problem or an addiction, uh, but acknowledges that he or she um, often uh, gambles uh, at a stated level take an arbitrary number, 500 a week, just uh, as a purely arbitrary yeah. number. What do you say the bank can do? What do you say the bank should do mm. if armed with that information? Yeah. Um, Commissioner, complex area, and um, so if I try and explain what we do do and ought to do, um, so my understanding of um, the responsible lending legislation, the IG209, and we should probably put scalability alongside this. I know it's a phrase that's used a bit loosely at times, but it is relevant to this. Um, th there's no obligation, as I understand it, in law to um, take extra steps to understand how customers are spending 
the, the credit that's advanced to them. Now, you might say, is it not reasonable that we should? Um, and I would say, I do believe it is reasonable that we should. And in fact, we have started to do that. Um, unfortunately, it was after Mr. Harris's case, but um, two things that we did to try and manage scenarios like this. So in April last year, we changed our credit decisioning rules such that if we observed high levels of gambling spend um, in a customer's credit card, we would not offer them any further credit limit increases. So that was a, a change that happened in April last year, which in isolation should have meant uh, we wouldn't offer significant CLIs to customers who exhibited high gambling spend on their credit card. Then in December last year, we extended that a step further. And as I say, I think that's going beyond where any legal requirement is. Um, in December last year, we, we um, created the capability or implemented the capability to look at gambling spend in both the credit card and the debit card or, or transaction account. Because as we see in, in this case study and in many others, customers are moving money between their credit card and other accounts and gambling on the other account. So simply saying ban credit cards for gambling doesn't actually solve the problem because they can just transfer to the other, other account. And so what we've done is now, if somebody um, is in that scenario that their spend level on their combined accounts is exceeds a threshold of income um, or total quantum dollar value spend of X, then we would not only not offer a CLI, we would also not accept an offer, uh, sorry, uh, an application for additional credit. So, no, no, long, on, long, on, long answer, um, and I think, you know, we fully acknowledge gambling is a very <laughs> challenging area, and, you know, Mr. Harris' case study demonstrates that in spades. Um, the challenge we have as a bank is gambling is, a le is legal, and therefore the choice, you know, choice we've grappled with is at what point do we say it's not okay for a, an adult to choose how much to spend on different activities you can quickly see the slippery slope that puts us on if we say you can't spend on gambling, well then what about other, you know, addictive spending on shopping or on alcohol or on any other causes. So, you know, this is what we've grappled with. Absent any clear legal or regulatory guideline, how do we determine when we intervene and uh, impose limits? Now, it, it's that I just want to tease out a bit further, not with a view to coming to some landing about what the law requires or doesn't require, but I notice in RG 209.33a, uh, the rubric is that depending on the circumstances of the customer and kind of credit contract, let's confine it therefore, depending on the circumstances of the consumer and a credit card contract, uh, reasonable inquiries, the guide says, could also include other expenditure that may be discretionary, such as entertainment, takeaway food, alcohol, tobacco, gambling, all of them perfectly legal uh, activities. So my question comes to, uh, can the bank do anything second part of the question you'll foresee is, should the bank do anything? But let's stick with, can the bank do anything to identify whether the customer that is either being offered or is seeking a credit limit increase has a spending pattern that shows that at least up till now, he or she has been spending uh, large sums on entertainment or takeaway food or alcohol or tobacco or gambling or all of the above or some combination. Yeah. Now, can the bank identify that? Yeah, yeah Commissioner, it's um, in many cases, yes, but not always because scenarios exist where a customer could have a credit card with us and a transaction account with another bank. Sure. They could draw down on their credit card from our side and make a cash advance and transact in the other bank. We wouldn't know what they're using their cash for. They could... Then, oh, do, sorry, <laughs> yeah, do so, finish. So I, I think, I don't want to try and get cute or anything, but, you know, clearly we can do these things and have, as I said, implemented some changes which do try and identify 
significant cases where customers are, are gambling a lot. But it is, it is always going to have gaps. Or I say always. They're, they're, certainly as we sit here, there are gaps and loopholes in that because customers can move money between accounts. Um, there are also complexities about not always knowing um, who a, a merchant is because descriptors aren't always clear. Um, customers can use cash and go and spend money on pokies. We would never know that either. So, you know, I think with limits, <laughs> yes, we can. Um, ought we to? Uh, the second part of your question, um, I suppose that's a question of interpreting um, that guideline in RG209. Then there comes a question of law, and, and yeah. I don't want to take and you down the point of you offering legal opinions about yeah, it, exactly. certainly if you're yeah. uncomfortable. And you sort of go back to the National Credit Act, which is all about making reasonable inquiries, yeah. which is what the law says. Um, and and I, I don't like to sort of rely too heavily on the scalability argument, but it is a reality because the guidelines do say scalability, you've got to have regard to the complexity of the, of the facility, the size of the loan. From our point of view, you know, we receive upwards of 40,000, 40,000 applications a month for credit cards, another 20,000 for CLIs. So what in those circumstances is it reasonable to expect us to do, um, noting that the large, large majority of people who do use their cards for gambling, you know, they're very occasional gambling spenders. And therefore, rather than that rather complex set of inquiries, does the inquiry become simpler and more relevant as saying that the bank as lender should look at at least its own records to see the comparison between money in and money out? Uh, for, for responsible lending purposes, Commissioner, or for gambling? No, to, just... Just Regardless generally. of what money is going out for, assume, I mean, it, it's Macawber, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, what was it? Income, 20 pounds, expenditure, 20 pounds, or sixpence, etc. It's a long time since I read Copperfield. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the basic question is money in, money out. If you look at your customers' accounts, and you see that money out each month is greater than money coming in each month, or whatever period you take. Should that be a flag that says, look, we might need to inquire about why the customer wants a credit increase, or whether we should offer the client a credit increase? Hmm. I see where you're going, Commissioner. Well, I'm glad the, you the, do. The difficulty, <laughs> the, yeah, you know, I don't want to sort of put problems in front of that question, but, you know, in a perfect world, we would have complete visibility of all the ins and outs, all the, the income and the expenditure of a particular customer, but the nature is many customers. Of your, what you've got, yeah. and you, you can't, at the moment, look at what other financial institutions no. have got, and all you can see is what's going through your bank. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that sort of comes back to the, the heart of the responsible lending obligations to make those reasonable inquiries about financial position, income, expenses, OFI liabilities, own liabilities, and so on. Um, but it, what I'm, I think, grappling towards yes. and very imperfectly is whether the inquiries about the expense side of the ledger uh, need to... Um, in effect, begin from the premise that our records show yeah. that you, Mr. or Ms. Customer, uh, have outlays of X dollars per month. Yeah. You need to tell us, yeah. uh, as lender, what your X dollars a month is going on. Yes. Rather than trying to build up uh, from uh, you spend X dollars on food, Y dollars on uh, yes. this, Z dollars on the other. I, I think you know, it's an idea that we've been trying to execute on. Um, for example, so if I can sort of play the scenario back, so we have a thing called Spend Tracker, which I think is a little bit to what you're describing, Commissioner, correct me right. if I'm wrong. 
but essentially where customers do transact with us that, um, and it's tools available for free on, on our online apps and so on, um, where spend is categorized according to different categories. So it could be, you know, groceries, entertainment, transport, or whatever. Um, now, we're not there yet, and uh, this is definitely not, I don't believe, required anywhere in legislation. We're trying to deliver this value to customers to say, well, we can help you understand your spend and track and categorize your spend every month so that you can get a better feel for how much you spend on transport, on entertainment, on everything else. Now, you could fast forward that idea you know, a long way with its imperfections, and that could create what I think you're describing, which is a data-driven view of customers' actual expenses, which could then be used in decision-making. Try to have I captured yeah, that correctly? Uh, or, and or, and, and, and they're not true alternatives, they're perhaps cumulatives. Are we at a point where you should be saying to customers, you show me that you've got a surplus reasonably regularly that would enable you to service at the rate of, here insert number, the further credit increase that either we're offering or you're asking for or however it's arisen. Is, is that what is required? Yeah. And, you know, and could that be delivered? Could it not be delivered? Yeah. It, it's a, if I can try and interpret that differently, it's, it's, it's a different way of describing the serviceability assessment because the serviceability assessment is saying, based on the income, based on the expenses, we think you've got X left at the end of the month to service your credit card or, or home loan or anything well, else? Well, based on what you've told us, under these categories, you've yes. got excellent. More granular information, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, well, and... Yeah, I, I absolutely, you know, aspirationally, that's where we want to get to, noting that there are a lot of complications because we only always have a partial view of a customer's financial situation. There's, you know, invariably customers will be multi-bank, they'll have accounts elsewhere, and we just wouldn't know what that is. Um, comprehensive credit reporting will help with that in some ways, but not on the expense Is it line. common for uh, customers to uh, uh, multi-bank, as you put it? I believe it is. I mean, you know, competitively, commercially, we'd obviously love that not to be the case. But if you look at the number of products our customers have, and this is published data, on average, customers of Commonwealth Bank have around three products per customer with us. And other banks are not that much different to that, a little bit less, but not a lot less. Um, on average, Australians have more than three products with financial institutions. You know, typically it would be a transaction account, a credit card, a mortgage, insurance of some kind. Uh, savings accounts, et cetera. So, you know, I think statistically, not many people would have all of their banking with one institution. Yeah. I've interrupted you far too long, Mr. Donnelly. <laughs> Mr. Van Horen, can I continue um, taking you a couple of provisions? of the regulatory guide, 209.46, sure. which is on the screen now. You'd agree, would you not, with uh, the statement, or ASIC statement, that you're obliged to take reasonable steps to verify a consumer's financial situation, and generally this will require some positive steps to verify the information provided by the customer? Yes. And at 209.93 on page, I think it's 34 of this, at point oh one two one. Um, you'd agree again that the asses assessment of whether a credit card contract is not unsuitable um, in the last sentence must be based on the information you obtained and verified when you, well, you made reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation? Yes. And at least in so far as the short form's concerned, there's no verification of liabilities, is there? Um, 
believe in the short form process, we would uh, check our own data on customers' liabilities, yes. but not um, OFI liabilities unless they fall below that income or risk score threshold I mentioned earlier. Um, and well, we've already dealt with expenses. Uh, and other than the application of the HEM or the, the modified HEM, you've said that um, there's no other steps taken in relation to the expenses um, that are provided by um, the prospective customer or the customer seeking a credit card or a credit card limit increase? Yes. Now, if you go, if I can take you to your assessment if the card is not unsuitable, this refers to a term you used with the Commissioner a moment ago about serviceability of the product. Uh, so the process that um, you will use is set out in those four subparagraphs. Yep. Um, and, and I'll take, well, I'll put it up on the screen, but it's on page five of your statement. Uh, and at specifically at paragraph K, it is that the serviceability assessment, which was an automated process, took into consideration the customer's financial position and assessed the customer's servicing surplus. Uh, now, is the servicing surplus, am I right to say that the servicing surplus is the amount of income over the expenses um, is that what you describe as a servicing surplus? Yeah, income minus expenses equals servicing surplus. Yeah, and when you um, describe it as $25, you then go on to say the minimum serviceability required the customer to have a surplus of income over expenses and liabilities the higher of 2.5% of their credit card limit or $25? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, whatever the servicing surplus is, that needs to be uh, the greater of $25 or 2.5% of what the proposed credit limit is, the one that they're applying. So $25 for over how long? Is that over a month? Oh, that's monthly, yeah. Yeah, I see. So your assessment will be that a person is able to get a, if I'm right, if they, on the basis of the expenses they declare or the application, if that's below the HEM, yep and the income, if their surplus is $25, am I right to say that that will, um, and they want a $1,000 credit right. card limit? Yep. Times 40, yep. That will then satisfy it? Yeah, uh, you know, I think you should probably focus, with respect to suggest, focus more on the 2.5% because the majority of credit limits are more than $1,000. So well, well, I'll give you the relevance yeah. of the 2.5% two, two is, um, so what this, what this is doing is testing the um, not unsuitability of that customer uh, for that credit limit. The 2.5% is relevant because the minimum repayment, is, as I'm sure we'll come to on any credit card, is 2%, 2% of the outstanding balance. Yes. And so think of this as a small buffer to say that you need to be able to pay 2.5%, in other words, slightly more than the minimum. I mean, just using my example, though, using my example of the $1,000, if I may, and I will sure, use sure. older, uh, uh, higher amounts, but using my example, the buffer that they have is $5 over the course of a month. Yeah. Obviously, uh, the bigger the credit limit, the bigger the buffer. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but you require customers to be able to pay 2% of their credit limit. Sorry. Sorry, I withdraw that. 2% of what they owe on their credit card. Uh, the minimum, yep. Is the minimum per month. Yes. So if we assume that someone has, this hypothetical person has a $1,000 credit card, they will be required to pay, and it's fully, assume it's the $1,000, they will be required to pay $20. That's right. And on your servicing surplus, you say, or your process is that the credit card is not unsuitable, provided that there is, in the case that I just gave, a $5 
surplus available per month. Yeah, I think the maths will follow and it'll vary depending on what limit you're using. Absolutely. But absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and is that an issue that you've given consideration to about whether or not that appropriately reflects um, what is a not unsuitable um, or what is just the Act says is a circumstance which is a not unsuitable yeah. circumstance for the giving of credit? Yeah, we've given a lot of consideration to this in lots of different respects. Um, and as you indicated in your opening earlier, uh, you know, never mind what we've given consideration to, the law is going to change um, shortly, which will require not a different repayment, I might clarify, but a different number to be used in the serviceability assessment. So that number is still to be um, put out by Treasury and ASIC, um, but they will, the indications are that that 2.5% uh, that we use will be a bigger number, you know, of the order of 3.5%, 4% or there or thereabouts. It's not going to be 20% is all indication we've had to date. Using, again returning to my, and it may be just my mind's need for simplicity, but the $1,000 example, if you look at the $1,000 example, I'm right to say, aren't I, that once you've gone through your process of verifying the income and taking one's word on expenses or using the, the HEM, a person is considered to be not unsuitable for the grant of a credit card, provided that they have $25 in that servicing surplus per month. Yeah, we're using the, we're using the, um, the reasonableness test, and that's where the reasonableness test will lead us. Well, that is where Commonwealth Bank considers the reasonableness test is. We do. And if if then one pays simply the minimum repayment on your on that exam my example I should say there's five dollars left over the course of the month. Yeah. Um, you recall when we discussed discretionary payments. And I'm not focusing on gambling here or any of the other discretionary payments, but. Uh, that uh, uh, concept of discretionary payments ought to have regard to, as I understand, unforeseen payments that might arise. Are you referring to the, the income-based HIM discretionary? Does that have regard constructed? Does that have regard to unforeseen uh, payments? I would have to check what all the components are. That's based on survey data, which. Um, looks at large numbers of Australians and determines what their average or their median discretionary expenditure is. So I couldn't tell you how much unforeseen stuff is in there. You know that under section 1312A of the National Credit Act, a person is unsuitable, uh, sorry, a credit contract is unsuitable if a customer could only apply with substantial hardship? Yeah, that's right. And substantial hardship is something that you've considered in coming to that, uh, that figure in the minimum serviceability ex assessment? Yeah, we have. And as I, as I keep saying, it's in the context of what the law says around reasonable inquiries. And reasonable inquiries is, you know, very, very open to interpretation. And having regard to what ASIC has said about scalability, uh, you know, that is, a, it is an important concept that we have taken into account in arriving at that. So when you're conclusion. talking about scalability, though, in scalability, that's a verification of... N not my reading of RG209. So my reading of RG209 is that scalability applies to both the reasonable inquiries yes. and the verification. And correct, and, and that is uh, right. But you... My question to you is that... Is it the position that CBA presumes that a person will not be in substantial hardship if they have $25 or more available to them after their expenses are deducted from their income, $20 of which would be paid if the credit card was maxed, would be paid to... Yeah, I'm going to follow your maths, and I'm not going to argue with your maths. I think the, you know, I keep making the point about having to make the right kinds of inquiries, and that's what the obligation is and that we, what we try and do, and we try and do that with a buffer as well. well. It doesn't leave much to go wrong, though, does it, on the serviceability on your... Uh, on, on those figures, it doesn't leave much to go wrong. Um, 
an extra coffee puts you on the knife edge, does it not? Yeah, I, I would. <laughs> I would say it's very important, so if I just take a step back, um, and there's industry data that will bear out what I'm about to say, um, our strategy, as a rule, is not to grant the biggest credit limit to a new customer, um, and this is borne out by comparisons between us and other banks. Um, we deliberately will allocate lower credit limits to new customers and over time, we'll increase those credit limits. We don't increase them any more than our competitors, but we deliberately choose to start with a lower credit limit. And there's a very important reason for this. We haven't even talked about CLIs yet. I'm sure we'll get there. But the, the reason for that is there's no better predictor, in our view, no better predictor of a customer's future behavior than the actual current behavior. As distinct from you know, forms, projections, estimates of expenditure, and so on. So our CLI strategy is built on this premise of saying that we would rather start with a lower, more conservative credit limit, not necessarily go to your example of you know, the 1,000 in, in, that, in that hypothetical case, um, to go to a smaller number. And then based on actual behavior, in other words, customers demonstrating their ability to, to manage that debt comfortably, to increase or offer increases to those credit limits over time. I understand that, although I'm focusing here though on where there's an application made, because where there's an application made, there's no verification of expenses. Of course, there's well, the, the- I think you need to qualify that with the HEM With the HEM, benchmark I accept that, yeah. but other than that base being applied, if I can put it that way. Uh, and <coughs> my point is simply that on the analysis that we've been doing about my hypothetical thousand dollars, it's 0.5 um, percent or $5, yeah. which is the the leeway for someone who has a full yeah. Mathematically, you're right. Um, as I say, maybe, and I couldn't give you this definitively, uh, we may not offer them the $1,000 limit in that case, given the strategy I've just outlined. I see. Although your processes allow that to happen, don't they? Um, we have credit decisioning models which... Uh, are calibrated, and it's not a simple go to the maximum. Those models are calibrated so that credit limits are offered based on what we think customers can afford. Although, I may have misunderstood it, in 25K, that's an automated process, though, is it Correct, not? Correct, yeah. It's, these are automated decision So models. it's not right to say that, uh, that there's different processes insofar as the calculation, calculation of the surfaceability surplus is concerned. Commissioner, the... And that paragraph says the minimum serviceability required, which is the converse of the maximum amount. Mm -hmm. There's, that's an automated process, isn't it, that yeah, you're correct, talking about yeah. in 25K? Absolutely. And, you know, as, as Council, as Charles has said, um, the minimum is, re is required to be that 2.5%. As I said earlier, we don't always go to the maximum limit, which is the inverse. No, and I'm not asking you about that. I'm dealing only with the minimum yeah. at this stage. Okay. Now, am I, right to, am I right to understand that the only difference between the short form and the medium form in terms of this, the analysis that's done by the Commonwealth Bank is that um, if internal salary credits aren't available for a medium form rather than a short form, a customer is required to provide supporting documentation. Is that right? That's right, for the income. Uh, but it's the same serviceability that we've just been discussing, isn't Correct. it? Um, as you predicted, I would like to ask you some questions about credit card limit increases. Um, at all relevant times, CBA offered credit card limit increases via direct banking, its digital channels and direct mail, didn't it? Uh, that's right. And uh, as I um, um, understand your, your evidence and perhaps un unsurprisingly in relation to um, changes that have been made in um, the law. Written offers are only made to customers who had opted in to receive those invitations. 
That's right. Uh, and they had those people had to be pre-assessed to be eligible for a CLI. Is that right? Correct. So pre-assessed is um, something we do in the background. It's not something that a customer initiates. We would look at our customer base and uh, do an eligibility assessment in advance of them potentially applying for a CLI. Well, Mr. Harris, they must have that must have happened Correct. in respect that, of that him. occurred. Yeah. Okay. And he then got. Um, well, we saw in the evidence. Uh, that he gave whilst you were in the room, that he was first offered a smaller increase and then he was later offered by direct mail a, a larger increase. Right. Now, if I can understand this process, we're now talking about Mr Harris's situation after he had his three credit cards. They were consolidated, of course, but we're talking about the limit increases. That's right. So this is a situation where... <clears throat> on the basis of the evidence that you've given, you're in a better position because you know about the um, repayments that that person has made over the course of the last so many months that they've had a credit card. That's right. And to be eligible to apply for a CLI, that is to receive a, a letter um, the criteria you set out are at paragraph 33 of your statement. Yes. Um, the credit card had to be open for at least six months. It's been at least six months since the last change. Um, the customers made regular repayments. Um, the, their monthly average repayments over the last six months were equal to or greater than 2% of the new, new limit to be offered. Yep. Emphasis on new limit, yep. Can I um, ask, when you say 2%, is that 2% of the new limit, not of what you're increasing it by? Of the potential new limit. So if the limit was 20 and it's going to 30, it's of the 30,000. It's of the great so on of that, the potential new limit. I see. In other words, the ability of the customer, at, in order to even get into the CLI eligibility population, we are testing at a high level, would they be able to repay 2% of the new limit? How long does it take if you pay, if you just pay off 2% of your credit card every month, you stop using it, um, I mean, so you stop using it and you just pay 2%, how long will it take to pay off your whole loan? Um, uh, well, the answer is it depends um, on many factors. Um, and so I could jump forward a little bit to, um, you know, if I can use Mr. Harris's statement, which is uh, part of the exhibits here. Yes. Um, <clears throat> there is a requirement under the National Credit Code to put in a minimum payment rewarding, which appears at the bottom of every Combank credit card, and I would expect all our competitors. Um, and it says, uh, it's called a minimum payment warning, because it is exactly that. And it says that if you pay the minimum every month, then it'll take you X years to pay off this balance. And then it says, if you want to pay it off over two years, you need to pay X dollars every oh, month. Oh, I see. Yep. Yes, yes, I'm familiar um, with that. Now, uh, you know, when I saw Mr. Harris's statement, I, was, I have to say I was quite surprised. It said 138 years. Um, having investigated that more, and I looked at my own credit card statement, and I was also surprised. Um, there are a number of important assumptions there. So if you go online, you can use any of our repayment calculators. You can use ASICs, um, uh, the online tools, and they will come up with a very different answer. And a couple of important reasons why. So Sorry, that Can I just stop you, Ms. Van Horen? Can I, I'll call up DJ H5 which is the document to which you were referring, yeah. and um, you... Yeah. Sure. <coughs> Should I carry on? Um, are you referring, when you refer to that, to um, the bottom... This is CBA.0507.0025.0150. I'm sure it won't take 138 years and yeah. one month, but um, I'm familiar with it. If you want to carry on, but I just thanks. 
Thank you. Mr. Kim. Um, you're, you're referring there, this is Mr Harris's statement that he received. He didn't go to it in his evidence forms part of his statement, but this is where he gave an example of the amount of money that he was spending on gambling. Um, and this was on the 23rd, for the period of the 23rd of May 2017 for approximately a month. And your evidence was um, about the requirement, which is on credit card, uh, commonly on credit card statements, or ought be, that it would have taken him 138 years and one month to pay off his account if he'd just made the minimum payments. Yeah. So a couple of important uh, factors that determine this, and, and we've, chosen, um, we've chosen a methodology here, and this can get a little bit technical, but that presents the most, um, the worst case outcome for a customer. Uh, and it is designed to be that minimum repayment warning encouraging them to pay more than that, that minimum. One of the, the most material and obvious things is that that calculation assumes you only pay 2% of the prior month's balance. Now, if you go online, use an online calculator, and you know in this example, 2% of $35,000 in rough numbers is $700 a month. If a customer chooses to keep paying $700 a month forever, not 2% of the balance as it reduces, then the repayment period is dramatically shorter. It's like eight years or thereabouts. I see. So, you know, that's one assumption we make. And the other assumption we make in this is, we assume, it depends on the interest rate, right? So the, the minimum repayment percentage of 2% is intended, I don't believe it's legislated anywhere, but it is the industry practice. It's intended to always exceed whatever the interest charge will be and therefore that it, the customer is at least slowly is, is at least reducing the amount of debt owing assuming they don't respend it um, and the assumption we make here is that we, we use the very highest possible interest rate which applies to the cash advance uh, transactions 21.24 percent but in any case in other cases uh, let him finish yes, go yeah, on, so if a customer's on. you know as was the case with mr harris he would have had a combination of cash advance balances and the low rate card, which is a 13% interest rate. And every dollar that gets paid knocks off the highest interest rate first until it gets to um, the lower interest rate. So this assumes that everything is at that 21% interest rate, which is extremely rare for any customer. Having said all that, um, you know, it, it certainly has, uh, has impact when you read 138 years. Um, and clearly that's part of what we want customers to be aware of is to pay more than the minimum. And were most of Mr. Harris's drawings cash advances? Commissioner, I haven't calculated it, but there were a very significant number of cash advances. Um, At least a reasonable a part. Reason, of, a reasonable part would have been cash advances. So this therefore is Therefore attracting 21%? On that component of the $35,000, yes. So making some less conservative assumptions. That is, in particular, assuming continuing to pay whatever 2% of this month's balance was every month thereafter. Yes. What sort of period would you have come up with? Um, what order I, I'd of prefer to do that online myself. It'll take two seconds, but I have done it. And from memory, it's between six and nine years, depending on which interest rates you put in. And <clears throat> just to relate that back uh, to uh, the evidence you gave earlier about approvals, where you take a uh, $25 or 2.5% of limit figure to account, are we speaking of periods of the order of greater than five or six years uh, to uh, wipe out the debt if you paid it at that rate uh, from month to month. Yes, Commissioner, it's of that order. Um, and just to calibrate that with the new um, regulations that uh, Treasury and ASIC are, are going to implement um, shortly under the new legislation, as I understand it, the discussion that's happening is um, targeting a period of paying off that balance, number to be determined, but you know, three, four, five, six years. It's of that order, it's under 10 years. And what that translates back into, if you back solve, is a monthly minimum repayment of, in the 
of the order of three to four or or thereabouts percent. It's not eight percent or ten percent. But again, let me try to put this into a slightly broader context. That the decision to grant a, uh, a credit card at all or to allow a particular level of credit uh, is made according to calculations that, uh, if borne out uh, in experience, would mean that the debt incurred on the credit card would take off the order of five, six, seven, eight years to clear. Is that right? That's right. Can I just add an if a proviso to that? Yes. <laughs> because a credit card is a, is a, is a revolving, revolving facility and therefore, um, you know, if a customer spends back up to the limit again, you know, it's, it's back to the beginning. But the very best case is that the customer is uh, mm -hmm. taking a limit which if used once and once only would take of the order of more than five years to meet. Is that right? Yes, it'll be of that order. Again, it depends on the interest rate as well. If you're on a 13% versus 21%, it'll obviously make it a bit The calculation short. is done once for all on the assumption that, or on, on the um, a criterion that, uh, the customer can service at a rate that will yield that result. Correct. Yes, thank yes. you. And can I just add one other factor, Commissioner? Of course. Because um, we've spoken a lot about applying for new credit cards where we've used the 2.5%, yes. and it's in, in my evidence. If we're talking about CLIs, um, and this would have applied in, in the case studies we've referred to, uh, if you look at my paragraph 41, then we apply 3%. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely not going to solve for all cases and, and certainly not Mr. Harris's case, but um, for CLIs we do have an assumption or an expectation of being able to service 3%, not 25 so and, to try and, and build in more of that buffer. And the time period comes mm -hmm. down to what, still something more than five years, does it? Uh, yeah, I, I'm estimating now without having modelled out all the scenarios, that. but it would probably be of that order, um, five years, to, you know, if you're on a low rate credit card, it'll be shorter. If you're on a awards credit card, it could be more like seven or eight, but it's of that order. Yes. You know, if, if it would help the Commission, we'd be happy to provide some scenarios just to give you exact numbers later on. Well, let's see what comes out in the uh, uh, issues that have to be addressed in submissions. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and if I can make the point that, and I, your answer to me, you will say that this is just the eligibility, eligibility, but it is fair to say that the eligibility criteria are also not very discerning when it comes to the eligibility for use of the CLI, sorry, CLI short form, are they? I'm afraid I can't agree with that because, <coughs> well, you know, discerning is, is a very um, subjective word. I think the, the really important point is CLIs are based on actual behaviour, actual repayment patterns, and with all these criteria that I've outlined here about not, you know, missing payments and being in arrears and so on. Um, and, you know, we do believe, rightly or wrongly, but we do believe that customers' actual repayment history is a very, very good predictor of future repayment capability. Although you would concede that the 2% is only actually uh, proof that they're able to, proof perhaps is not the right word, particularly in this forum, but is, uh, is only evidence, the 2%, only evidence is the fact that they would be able to pay the minimum repayment on the increased limit. Yeah, and, and just recall we're talking, or if I'm understanding correctly, about eligibility. Yeah. Yes. There's still another step to come, which is the uh, serviceability suitability assessment. Um, does the, as a matter of analysing that eligibility, one question that arises is whether or not the, it's in the bank's interest for the person to only pay the minimum. Uh, you know, 
I don't think it is. You know, you might say, well, we'll, we'll maximize our interest revenue. Um, it's not in our interests to have customers who are in a, in a position of uh, financial difficulty. We've put in place a lot of tools to try and assist customers to manage their debt. I'll mention one or two. So at a tap of a few buttons on a phone, a customer can decrease their credit limit, not increase, decrease it permanently. Customers can put caps in place in the amount that they can spend, um, which are hard caps. They can change them later, but they are hard caps. Created the ability for customers to close their credit cards online with a tap of a few buttons. That was later than Mr. Harris's current okay. closure attempt. Um, so I think, you know, in trying to demonstrate intent about are we only about trying to maximize the amount of borrowings, I, I don't believe the facts bear that out. You go on to uh, explain at paragraph 38 and following the analysis that's undertaken of a credit limit, in, a credit limit increase application that's actually made using the short form. And you say at paragraph 41, you've drawn the Commission's attention to this already, that the amounts included in the questions referred to in subparagraphs 38C and 39C, so they calculate the after, um, after tax um, and expenses, how much money is left to repay the credit card. That's what 38C and 39C refer That's right. to. Um, and those amounts ought be to satisfy the application 3% of the new limit selected by the customer. Is that right? That's right. So if someone can pay according to their um, expenses, I don't mean to sound like uh, a broken record, but of course that's the expenses calculated on the way that you've said previously. That's right, yep. If they can pay 3% um, of that new limit, that um, entitles them to, um, or they would satisfy the requirements of the credit limit increase. Yeah, the serviceability component, yeah. Suitability, should I say. And you then go on to describe the um, you then go on to describe under the heading responsible lending obligations in relation to the credit limit increases. You say that in assisted channels for both forms of applications is paragraph 45. You say at, at subparagraph X, for CLI short form applications, the customer's average repayments over the last six monthly statement cycles were verified to be at least 2% of the new limit. Do you see that? That's right. How is that any different when it comes time to assessing eligibility from, uh, from the eligibility to get the offer? as compared to what is applied to whether or not the increase should be granted? Sorry, just repeat your question. Why is that any different to the figure that's used to determine whether or not they're eligible for, for uh, a CLI um, offer? So this is around, uh, you're referring to Paragraph F, just so yes, 45 F. It is a bit confusing because there's various two percents and three percents. So the, the first three percent I referred to was um, in paragraph 41, which refers to CLI short forms, which uh, is based on three percent of the new limits. In other words, the the net servicing surplus, if you will, equals three percent of the new limit. That's uh, the, the way that the um, serviceability assessment does that calculation. And then you're asking me about the verification? I'm, I'm asking, when you say at 45F that for CLA short form applications, you say in support of uh, the bank's responsible lending obligations that the customer's 
average repayments over the last six monthly cycles were verified to be at least 2%, yep. that is the minimum, of the new limit. So that's, this is looking backwards, paragraph 45F is saying the average repayments over the last six months. I see. Are, yeah, and that's what we're looking to see the customers, as I was saying earlier, the customer's ability to, uh, the best predictor of ability to pay in the future is their actual past repayment record. So that's what 45F refers to. <laughs> Mr. Van Horen, these policies are creating circumstances, are there not, where banks are giving credit to per people based on whether minimum repayments can be made, not whether or not they can pay off the credit card? Uh, it certainly is checking that they can make at least the minimum, but as we were discussing with the Commissioner a second ago, if they sustain their payment at that dollar value, so $700 in, in, this, in the case study, um, they would pay that off a lot, lot quicker. And so that's a choice customers make, and some customers will choose to pay the, the absolute minimum. Certainly what we would encourage, and you just use our calculators online or go to ASIC's calculators, it'll um, give you the answer if you sustain your payment at the same but amount you, rather than keep reducing it every month. But you know that paying only the minimum repayments would lead to just a cycle of the debt continuing for a long time. Yeah, you? which is why we enc encourage customers and assess customers' ability based on more than the minimum. If you can. pay the minimum payment of $100 per month on a credit card balance of $5,000, how long would it take you to pay off the credit card? Uh, I'd need to use the calculator because you've got to accrue interest there as well. Um, Do you have the number? I mean, it's not that good that I can compound interest. No, 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 no. Um, if I could take you to RCD.0021.0021, um, perhaps I, um, instead of 0390, I think it's in the next document. So, if I understand correctly, the eligibility at uh, sorry, you point to in the responsible lending part of your statement that the customer's average repayments over the last six months were verified to be at least 2% of the new limit. My question to you was, how long will it take to pay off a credit card if you pay off 2% of the limit? I've used an ex the example here in this page yep. is a $5,000 credit card. Right. So I'm using a different example, probably more in line with perhaps what you might say is a more realistic um, credit card limit. It's a Platinum Awards card, like Mr Harris's, or I think Mr Harris's second card, and there's a payment of $100 a month. Yes. Um, and if we go to the next page, and this is obviously on the Commonwealth Bank calculator, yep. it tells the reader that it takes around nine years and three months to pay off that amount. Do you yeah, see that? That's exactly right. So to the examples we quoted earlier, and I said it depends on the interest rate, so this is the, an awards card, which has got the highest interest rate, 20%. If you do the same calculator at a 13.24%, which is a low rate, or 9.99, which is a, a new um, product launching next week, in fact, that number of nine years will drop a lot. I don't profess to calculate it in my head, but it'll be five or six years. Can I put it to you, the use, though, of 2% by way of the responsible lending processes to which you point to is not sufficiently robust to consider whether or not there will be significant hardship to a customer? Well, I would, I'm afraid I can't agree with that. I think, um, you know, the, the question would be, well, what else is reasonable to do in the circumstances? I want to just ask you a couple of questions about Mr. Harris that can come down. Um, 
can I actually, if that can come, can that be tendered? Uh, of course. Uh, exhibit 1.162. Uh, credit card payment recalculator. Uh, RCD 0021 0031 Thank you, Commissioner. Um, you say that in April 2016 was the first time that Mr Harris incurred direct charges for gambling on his credit card, is that right? Um, Paragraph 52 of your statement. Yes, I believe that's right. And so just to clarify, that's... Uh, based on reviewing all the credit card statements, initially the three and then the consolidation to the one into the low rate card, um, the first time we could identify a, a gambling related transaction on the credit card was in April 16. Prior to that, there were cash advances coming out of the credit card and, to another account. And Mr. Harris has given evidence about what he did that for, Absolutely. but I don't put to you that you, the Commonwealth Bank, was aware of that. Um, I don't put to you that the cash advance, that you were aware that he was using those cash advances for gambling. Um, Just to yeah, make sorry, you said, were, if the question is, were we aware in April 2016, is that the question? And, and no, I was asking you whether or not that was the first time he put charges yes, on his credit correct, card. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. the neutral I question. I think you know, the obvious point is, should we, to your question earlier, should we have had algorithms or something that were identifying gambling spend now, though, you would identify that, wouldn't you, in respect of Mr Harris? I'm not asking you to say it's the first time that he gambled in April 2016. Yeah. But if, if your evidence at paragraph 60... Yep. At 62A, which you gave yep. previously, that in April 2017, CBA yep. introduced new rules to exclude credit card customers from receiving credit limit increase offers. That's right. Um, and that you, you go on to say that there was... Uh, that other changes have been made. That's right. Uh, what would have been, what would, what would have happened differently in the case of Mr. Harris? Um, well, I, it, it would not have, you know, I don't know if this is commercially sensitive, but I, I'll share it as best I can. Um, the, the rules that we've put in place are um, taking into account identified gambling spend and seeing it, and it varies slightly if it's a brand new customer or an existing customer, but essentially if it exceeds a certain dollar value, um, and I might get the numbers wrong if I guess them, if it exceeds something like, um, I think something like $10,000 over three months um, of the order of, you know, these are estimates and from memory, of the order of 25% of income over the previous three or six months has been spent on gambling. So that gives you an idea of the kinds of rules that are happening. And therefore, a customer who's making an occasional transaction would not trigger that. And it's not designed to do that. And yes. it's certainly not our role to stop people, you know, betting on the Melbourne Cup or whatever, it, whatever the case might be. And what well, certainly would have picked up, and I'm not putting this as a criticism of the bank this, on, on this issue, because no credit limit increase was offered after June. But in June 2017, the statement that we went to before, which had 138 years on it, yep. that was a statement where $18,000 was taken out over the course of a weekend. Yep. And that would have triggered. It would have triggered, yeah, absolutely. But at the relevant time, yep. it didn't. Correct. Um, and you accept that you were on notice in October 2016, the conversation that evidence was given in relation to that conversation by Mr Harris, that as at that date, CBA was on notice yeah. of his gambling? Yeah, look, I, I definitely don't want to sit here, you know, contradicting the evidence of, of Mr Harris, <laughs> knowing the circumstances that he's been through. Um, I would add one thing, though, to that October 2016 conversation, and it's in the transcripts, and I've listened to, listened to it myself. Um, which is that, um, you know, you say on notice, uh, it was part of that conversation which was um, had with the person in the contact centre. So yes, to the extent that the Commonwealth Bank somewhere had information to that effect, yes, we did. Um, we did also in that very same conversation, the same call centre agent said, um, having heard from Mr Harris that he had a, a gambling problem, in his words, um, and she said, there's a, um, I see there's a CLI offer. Would you like me to cancel it? And Mr. Harris said, no, don't. I may do that later. 
So, you know, I, I just add that for the completeness of the record. Um, The, uh, what you point to is that which is at CBA point zero five one six point zero 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 one point zero zero three eight. Uh, sorry, it might be point zero zero three six at point zero zero three eight. Uh, and I think the previous page, which I, I won't take you to, but the previous page, the operator said, final question I have just in regards to the credit card that you have got with us at the moment, you are conditionally approved to increase your credit limit. And Mr Harris says, I've seen that, seen that, uh, nah, yep, so what are you wanting to do with it? And that's when Mr Harris says, N not just yet, I need to, I do not really understand why they've offered me that considering they know clearly that I use for gambling and stuff like that, yep. So I think, that it's pre, I think that it's pretty bad of them to offer me that when I clearly have a gambling problem. Do you see that? I see that. And then you pointed me to the fact, rightly, that there was a, um, uh, I'm sorry, before I get to that, then the operator said, well, I mean, you can choose to do on your card, we can't control. We obviously look at payments and things like that. Now, you've given evidence that the position would be different now, um, sitting here now. Um, but in 2016, that was what the operator said yep. in relation to Commonwealth's processes. David, of course, of course, no, I know, but really they should look at that and go, clearly right, he gambles, so we are not going to give him any more money. Operator, yep. Um, at one point, I had three credit cards, they let me max them out and then put it all into one and then offered me more money. Yeah, I'll decline the offer, um, but yeah. Then you are right to say that he said, I wouldn't decline it yet, I'm going to increase it, but not just yet. I want to sort my gambling stuff out first. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and then Commonwealth Bank proceeded to send a letter, I think 11 days after that phone call, offering him that very limit though, didn't yeah. it? So as I, as I said earlier, you know, we absolutely acknowledge we shouldn't have, you know, all, in a perfect world, we would have used this information from this conversation to find uh, its way back into our credit models. At the time, we haven't had that sophistication. As we sit here, we still don't. It's clearly something that we believe we need to do. Um, and therefore, having had this information from Mr. Harris, we should not have sent him that uh, subsequent CLI offer. So the systems as they presently stand would or would not catch the problem at the point of this conversation? Yeah, correct, Commissioner. You, you know, well, would or would it, not? It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, there's no automated way to capture oh. that information. Um, you know, we need to build a, a flag, there's, there's complexities around all that, but we need to find a way to make sure that if somebody, and you'd appreciate there's a lot of people out there, um, has a conversation that flags a customer could be in difficulty, you know, we have other flags for domestic violence where we then trigger you know domestic violence support programs we don't have something that triggers um, a proactive action around a self-disclosed matter like this and it's something you know we want to do something about it we've got to work out how we can do that because it's clearly not a simple thing to execute no I mean you safely for customers either and fairly you've been given the opportunity you have given evidence about that at paragraph 62 about some of the steps that are being taken. But in relation to Mr Harris, you concede that um, there were clearly negligent oversights on behalf of the bank in relation to his situation. Um, you, you're using words that were used by somebody else later. You, using well, I'm asking you, though, whether or not you agree with um, what... Um, negligent oversights. Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to, for a second, um, uh, pretend that we did the right thing. I absolutely wish we'd had a way to use that information or had some escalation in place to uh, block any further CLIs. Um, whether that equals negligent oversight, I'm not sure that's the same thing. And
definitely, well, uh, but you say in your statement in that CBA now admits that it should not have increased Mr Harris's credit card limit after he informed CBA of his gambling problem. Correct, yeah. <coughs> The reason for your change to your statement, um, Mr Van Horen, was because, unfortunately, the Commonwealth Bank sent a letter to Mr Harris setting out the full amount um, owing on his credit card statement again, didn't it? Uh, are you referring to paragraph 59A? Yes, well, maybe the, the documents themselves. Um, if I can go to CBA.0517.0012.0001. <clears throat> this is CVH, I think, 16 now in your statement. When I say now, it didn't appear in the first yep. statement. Um, wasn't in existence, I think, at the time of that st statement. Don't have it. No, okay. That m has that been given to have us? Have you got access to it, I Mr do, Van yeah. Horen? Can yeah. you tell me? Generally speaking, what it is, we yep. seem not to be able to display it at the moment. Please, Mr. So, um, just tell me you're referring to the same one there, um, please. But essentially, it was a letter dated the 6th of March, which is very yes, recent, um, addressed to Mr. Harris uh, saying, you know, your request for help. Recently asked for uh, help in managing your debt to us. We asked you to provide certain information. I'm sh shortcutting slightly. So we can assess your request and have sent, sent you a reminder letter. We have not received the information requested and based on the current information available, we are declining your request for help. Then it provides the details of his account and it refers to a balance of $35,000 odd dollars. I see it's on the screen now. Yes. Um, okay. And then what you need to do, contact us and so on. And then the second letter um, or the second, the subsequent exhibit, which if I go to, essentially was on the 14th of April um, to Mr. Harris saying, I'm contacting you to apologize for the letter sent to you last week, dated 6 March, which was sent to you in error. Please find attached a letter to confirm the outstanding balance of your MasterCard, which was in fact the 23,000 number. So, you know, the question is, well, what happened? Um, this letter was sent in error. It, the reason it's a um, Subsequent amendment to my original statement is this has all come to light since the original statement was submitted, so apologies for that. Um, we've done an investigation as to how this letter was sent because it is clearly the wrong balance owing um, and uh, should not have been sent. And it was not a system-generated letter, so we're investigating how the letter was sent because it should not have been sent, which is why as soon as we became aware of it, um, we followed that up with an apology, and I apologize again to Mr. Harris. Um, that it was the wrong number and the letter should not have been sent and the correct balance owing is the $23,000 figure. Are you able to tell me generally what the problem was that led to it being sent? Uh, still under investigation, Commissioner. Yeah. yeah, we've had a significant effort since this came to light to understand how. Um, I can, this is not a good um, excuse or anything, but we have very, uh, uh, not state-of-the-art systems in our collections environment. They're in the process of being upgraded. It's a very, very significant investment project to upgrade them. It started in the middle of last year or finished in the middle of this year. And unfortunately, things like this happen because uh, the way in which communication is generated is not the way it should be. So I mean, the process um, seems to have let the Commonwealth Bank down in relation to the fact that this letter was sent and ought not have been sent. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, apologise again. 
I think that's it, isn't it? Um, yes, thank, thank you. Mr. Thank you very Kelly. much, Mr. Van Horn. Any other parties seek leave? Very well. Mr. Sherry. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Van Horen, do you remember the Commissioner was asking you about your information and you commented that you, don't, you only have partial information about a customer's financial position and you mentioned something called the comprehensive credit reporting, which you said would improve the position. Could you explain what that is, sir? Yeah, so the comprehensive credit reporting legislation um, has been passed through Parliament, CCR for short, and what that will do is move um, the way in which credit bureaus, so these are third parties uh, to whom banks and other credit providers supply data and then get data back. Um, it's going to go from what's simply in today called a negative environment to a positive environment. So today what happens is if a customer is applying for a credit, all we get back from the bureau is information if they have defaulted or if they've missed payments. So in that sense, negative information comes back to us. The new reporting obligations which start on 1 July um, and will be rolled out over the 12 months thereafter um, provide positive reporting. In other words, we get information back from the bureau on customers' good behaviour, you know, good credit behaviour as well. They have, you know, Clive Van Horen has made his credit card or home loan repayments consistently for the last 12 months. And so that information we other credit providers will use in credit decisioning um, and it particularly helps fill the gap of the OFI liability piece where if a customer says I've got zero liability somewhere else, you know, the credit bureau will be able to confirm that's the case and or what their payment record is. Would it tell you the amount? It's performance rather than default, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, it's a more holistic view of the customer's overall performance. Would it tell you the amount of the um, OFI? Um, I believe it'll tell us the repayment amount, not the liability, we'd have to back solve for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Dinelli. Uh, I note the time, Commissioner. Can I update? Uh, Mr. Sorry, Van that's Horen. nothing fu Nothing further. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Van Horen. Nothing further. May he finally be excused, Your Honour? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Commissioner? Excused further attendance, Mr. Van Horen, at least for this round. <laughs> <laughs> Never that. say never, Mr. Van Hoor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I, I note the time. The next witness will be um, Mr. Um, William David Malcolm of Westpac, and it might be convenient um, for him um, to be called first thing tomorrow morning, if that's convenient. Are we to... travelling for time becomes the question. The, the position is this. Um, Commissioner, uh, there is another witness from uh, CBA, uh, Mr Gareth Russell, when we'll be tendering his statement. Yes. Um, that will happen tomorrow morning. Um, Mr Malcolm will give evidence um, tomorrow morning. Uh, Can we say that that calls him now? It's pretty much a case, isn't it? And there are two other witnesses, uh, Commissioner, and we'll give some anxious consideration to that overnight. Uh, my learned leader, Ms Orr, um, would, um, will close tomorrow, as you um, are well aware, Commissioner, and we would anticipate, subject to the Commission's convenience, that any further evidence will be f finished in the morning and that that closing would commence um, immediately after lunch, if that was convenient to you. I, th I think we've got to at least aim for that kind of timetable to uh, allow a reasonable laying out of issues uh, that are seen as emerging from this round. So, um, yes. Um, but if I begin at 09.45 tomorrow, uh, that should be, I won't say comfortable, at least doable. Um, yes, Your Honour. Yeah. Yes, um, Commissioner. You may, may attempt a verbal, Mr Sheehan, uh, Mr Dinelli, I'm not. Uh, all right. No, that, that, that's convenient, um, Commissioner, and then we will aim to close um, and provide the assistance that you've indicated um, from 2pm. Right. Well, we'll adjourn until 9.45 tomorrow morning.